Hello, I'm Sky Matsuhashi, founder of SmartPokerStudy.com, the place for poker players who are always striving to be better today than they were yesterday. Poker people, in last week's Q&A, episode 61, I answered questions about tilt, playing live cash, facing check raises, and the Colossus at this year's WSOP. Hey, Poker People, thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much for telling your friends, and thanks for sharing the show, because that's how we grow. Alrighty, I'm so excited to bring you a very, very, very special show today. I've got an interview with James Split Suit Sweeney. He's been playing poker for over 10 years, been a well-respected and prolific coach for much of that time, and I'm sure you've seen a ton of his training videos, or you might even be a subscriber to his training site, redchippoker.com, and you probably listen to his awesome Red Chip Poker podcast as well. Well, however you know him, or even if you don't, I am thrilled to have him on the podcast. We talk about his poker past, coaching his students, and one of the most important skills there is in poker, hand reading. Split suit, uh, or James, created a very solid framework for learning and putting hand reading skills to use in your game. Through the hand reading course that he created called simply the Hand Reading Lab, he takes you through the art and science that is hand reading, and we discuss a bit of it today. Plus, James has a very special offer for us, so stick around to the end for that. You can find links to everything that James talks about in this episode's show notes at smartpokerstudy.com slash pod62. But before we get to the interview, the Smart Poker Study podcast is now on Patreon. What's Patreon, you ask? Well, it's a way to support your favorite artists and content creators. Patreon is kind of like Kickstarter, but instead of supporting just one project, you're supporting a creator for all the work they do. And your support means so much to me. There are different levels of support, and with each level comes different rewards. You can get over-the-top podcast shoutouts, early release podcasts, extra uh, patron-only podcasts and videos, copies of my future ebooks, and more just for supporting me with a monthly contribution. There's also some crazy goals I've set. Help me hit these monthly goals and you'll hear more strategy content in the form of more questions answered, longer podcasts, or even more frequently scheduled podcasts. Who knows? With your help, I might be podcasting five days a week. I just made my Patreon page live, and I've already got one supporter. Dusty, thanks so much for the support. Here's your shout out. I found a picture of you online and you are one incredibly handsome poker person. I wouldn't doubt you're a male stripper or something and you must make the ladies just swoon with your good looks. Good on you, mate, and thanks for the support. So if you want to support the podcast, earn some rewards, or just want to learn more about Patreon and what I'm doing on it, visit patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy. And Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N patreon.com slash smart poker study without further ado here's the interview with james split suit sweeney Okay, poker people, I am so incredibly fortunate to have James Split Suit Sweeney as my guest today. He's a longtime poker professional, coach, strategy video maker, and poker podcaster. I won't go any further because I'm sure most of you already know him. So, James, welcome to the show. Thanks, Sky. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. I really appreciate your time today. What you, what you been up to? Uh, today or just in general? <laughs> just in general, yeah. Just in general, I have been creating a lot, a lot of content. This year has been very, very content heavy. Mm -hmm. And because WSOP is right around the corner, it's been creating all the content to cover the months that I am busy with WSOP stuff. So it's, it's getting ahead on all the videos, all the podcasts, all the articles, it's been a lot. It's a lot, it's a lot of content this year. Absolutely. I could imagine. And the WSOP being as long as it is and how many videos you put out and podcasts you put out, I'm sure uh, you've got probably a few more, you know, like 20 more hours of work to do, I'd imagine. Oh, yeah, at least. I have last last count. I did six videos today. So I have Holy another. Cow. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a lot. <laughs> Today was, I'm actually surprised I have any voice left for this. I, I tried my best to make sure you got the, the best of my voice possible. And then I have another, what, six to do tomorrow, three next week, and uh, obviously tons and tons of podcasts. So, yeah, it, it'll be a, a busy month, to say the least, before WSOP kicks in. Absolutely. Are, are all of these videos that you're making, are they for, like, future courses? Or are they actual, like, you know, red chip poker training videos? Or what are they? 
it's a combination, not core stuff. So this, this year I've already been doing a lot of core stuff. So I'm kind of cutting back on that for the moment, focusing more on making redshift content and also my ask split suit videos that I release on, on YouTube. That's right. Yeah. Those ask, ask split suit videos are incredible. You know, the first thing I noticed about them was just the professionalism in them. When most poker strategy videos that you see on YouTube and even my own videos, I have to admit they're like 10% the level of professionalism that you put into it. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And, and that was something I kind of identified early on is that a lot of the poker training material was really, it was great from a strategic angle, but it was really awful to listen to, really awful to look at. And I was like, if I'm going to do this, I need it to look pretty and I need the strategy to be just as good as it looks. So it, it took a lot of time to really develop the look and feel of all the videos. But I think once I finally found my groove with it, you know, it's been really nice being able to just pump out lots and lots of content and, and get a lot of people's questions answered. I mean, at this point, I started the, the hand drop box a couple months ago and I already have about two years worth of questions asked. Holy cow. How, how often are you putting out answers to those questions? Weekly at this point, that could change over time. I, it could go higher, could go less, but I think I'll be sticking it weekly for at least at least a while, to say the least. Nice, man. That's really. I'm looking forward to all that. Thank so, you. um, you know, I, I do want to ask you about. I know about you as a coach and everything, and a lot of the content you put out there through YouTube and your Red Ship Poker. But what is your playing experience like? I know you've been playing for over a decade now, but how did you get your start in poker? So I consider mine to kind of be the, the typical story of the, ple of the pre Black Friday guy. Mm -hmm. So I started playing back in college and back then it was playing a lot of tournaments and eventually at some point I started playing some live, but then I also, because it was, it was a casino where you could play when you were 18. So I was going there and I was playing a lot and I was doing well financially, but then I was dumping it all back in the pits. Oh, so, geez, you were one of those, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? I need to just cut this off cold turkey and decide to cut poker out of it, too, and just quit for probably a handful of months, give or take. But then all my friends continued playing. We really recognized online as an opportunity, and they were just like, you kind of have to come back. So I came back to it, started playing six max cash games and then full ring cash games. And I've kind of always been more of a cash game player. I did play tournaments for a while. I started with sit and goes and stuff online, but I transitioned over to cash pretty quickly and really just loved it. And then after college, I moved out to Vegas and Black Friday happened a few years after that. And then from that point onwards, I was really just playing live one, two and two, five in Vegas with a little bit of five, 10 every now and then. Well, nice, man. When you when you actually moved out to Vegas, was it to be a pro or did you go out there for whatever degree you got to work and to play poker? No, I've never really had a legitimate job. Hmm. It's, I'm, I'm one of those people. Very, very blessed to say that. But it's one of those where all of my, not all of my, most of my friends from college that were playing poker dropped out and moved out to Vegas and started doing that professionally. I decided to stay back and get my degree. And then as soon as I got my degree, I jumped right out to Vegas with them, lived in a house with them for a while, and then did a little moving around back and forth, then came back to Vegas and was you know back to coaching half and playing half. And then over time, business started to creep into it. And then that started to, started to cut the pie chart a little bit, but... Yeah, playing's always been something that I've enjoyed doing, to say the least. Gotcha. How many hours a week would you say that you actually put in at the tables now? At this point, I'm really only putting in about a session a week. Uh, it's really, at this point, I just have too much other stuff going on. Plus, I have a son. Plus, I have a wife. You know, they they definitely need attention as well. And I they deserve it, and I need to give it to them. And it's just one of those where, at this point, I need to make sure I play because I need to make sure that I'm keeping up on current game trends and not missing anything when mm -hmm. I'm coaching stuff. But it's one of those where I can only dedicate so many hours at this point, unfortunately. I wish I had more hours, but... You know, it's either cut out some of the content or cut out something else. And at this point, I kind of like the balance that I've kind of created in my life. Good. Yeah. Sounds yeah. good to me. Are you when you are playing that one session, I would assume it's cash at a local casino, right? That's correct. So I mo we moved out of Vegas uh, what, about two years ago, give or takes. And we moved up in the Portland, Oregon area. So we go down or I go down to local card clubs out here and it's it's a little bit different the way they structure it. It's it's cash games sort of, but it's technically they have this weird rule that where they can't do cash games, so they have to run it as like a semi tournament. 
Oh. It's it's really, really bizarre. But ultimately, yeah, you get 1-2 out there. You get a little bit of 2-5, but primarily it's a lot of 1-2 out in Portland. That's interesting. So are you constantly – if it's a little bit like a tournament, does that mean blinds don't go up, do they? Or are there yeah, antis no. in, in play or – no, you're you're totally right on. So it's it's weird. The blinds don't change, so they kind of run it as what they call a shootout. So, but what it is is the every single hour, or in some rooms it's two hours, the game will kind of shut down momentarily, and you have the option to cash down, rebuy up, or leave the table altogether. You cannot leave in the middle of a session unless you lose your stack, in which case you can leave at that point. So it's like busting a tournament in that regards. Precisely. Mm. And it's also weird because let's say you decide to use the restroom and it's your turn to pay the blinds when you're in the restroom, you actually still have to pay your blinds. So someone will oh. reach over, take blinds off of your stack. So that way it technically runs like a tournament in that respect. How funny is that? So that's how they get around the laws there. Yeah. It, the first couple of times I played, I was like, I don't understand what the heck you guys are doing. Yeah. Pausing every hour. This is confusing the heck out of me. Uh-huh. But I, I got the, the gist of it over time. But like they still have cash game stuff. Like You can still straddle and do all that kind of fun stuff. It's it's just a bizarre workaround they found. Totally. No, oh, that's awesome, man. Um, Earlier, you had mentioned, you know, you went to Vegas with the buddies and everything playing poker and then gradually business got into it. And I would assume by business, does that mean strictly coaching or did you start your redshippoker.com site way earlier than I than I even realized? Oh, no. Redshift didn't start until about two or three years ago. So mm. Redship is a little bit more recent. But in terms of business stuff, so I went to Syracuse University and I went for business and marketing was my specific major. And I always knew that I wanted to do something business wise, but... You know, I, I kind of didn't really get into that until like a year or two after graduating. And then it was just experimenting with a bunch of different things, SEO projects, music projects, mm. all this, that, and the other thing. But as far as coaching itself, that was a totally different thing. That I actually started doing back in college. Started doing that probably late 2007, 2008, give or take. So I've really been coaching for, has it really been eight years? Long time. It has been eight years. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, time flies. But uh, yeah, so I started coaching then and, you know, that was taking up a decent part of the pie chart as well, both during senior year of college and then for the few years after. That was a very, very large chunk of the pie chart just because I am one of those people that when I coach, it's not just like if it's an hour of coaching, I just show up for the hour and then I'm done. There's also the pre-text, the post-text, there's all that. So like one hour sessions really take up about three hours of time. And I really hadn't figured out a nice schedule for that yet. And that wasn't something I figured out for multiple years after starting coaching. I gotcha. Um, whoever your first student was, is he or she still playing? Do you know? I don't. I mean, maybe even if you know, even if you remember the first student so long I, ago. I do actually remember my first student and I don't want to name names. Uh-huh. They did end up becoming a coach over at Deuces Cracked for oh. a while. Great. So, yeah, I'm not sure if they're still playing. I don't think they're playing regularly, but last I remember, they contacted me about three months and they had a question about a video. So I'm assuming they still play sometimes. Oh, that's killer, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, So I would imagine when you started off, it was kind of tough uh, figuring out how to coach and everything and trying to explain the strategies that you formulated on your own or learned and, and teach somebody else on it. But Like currently, when you sit down for a student's very first session, you know, I'd imagine that maybe you're going through a database or if they're a live player, you're probably asking a ton of questions, you know, to find out what their leaks are. What's the most common leak right now that you find that your students have? So right now, I'd say the average person is a little too nitty and a little too showdown value focused. And I'd say that's the major one. And it's one of those where like, if you had asked me this question five, six, seven, eight years ago, it definitely would have been that people just had no idea how to fold. And in fact, knittiness would have been the polar opposite of the Oh, curve. interesting. Yeah, but as people have developed the ability to fold, they've taken that a step too far and now they're folding far too often. And that's what I want to see people start veering away from because if you're folding too often, your frequencies are going to be all messed up. You're just going to become a massive target and this game will become really, really hellish really, really quickly. Absolutely. Those laggy players and even just your regular tag players can take advantage of you when you're folding too much. Oh, super easily. Like mm-hmm. if you're only given action with the top 10, 15, 20 percent of your range when you're facing raises and, and re-raises, your life is going to be miserable. Absolutely miserable. And it's, the thing is, is that it's not going to feel too terrible because you only see yourself losing these little pots, right? You're not losing the home run pots and our brain plays a trick on us and says, oh, congratulations. Good. You didn't lose a big pot. 
But in losing all those small, medium-sized pots, by the end of the day, you have to double up just to be back to break even on the day. And yeah. that's not really where you want to be in this game. No, absolutely not. That's awesome. It's probably something that you, uh, I know that you recently released a podcast all about being nitty and stopping to be nitty. Is that the, I guess uh, that's what that recent podcast was all about? Yeah, exactly. It, it just released uh, when we were recording this about a day ago, and it's mm-hmm. called uh, Being a Knit is Bad for Your Health. Nice. Obviously, a little bit of a silly silly title, but ultimately the, the concept is if you're playing too nitty, poker is not going to be fun for you. But there's hope. There's at least understanding that, okay, maybe I'm playing too nitty today, but I can take steps towards getting out of this so I can start to either become a solid tag, maybe start breaking into lag ta- territory, but ultimately, being really, really nitty is just as bad as being really, really fishy. Yeah, I can understand that. Uh, what is the first step to getting out of your nittiness? First is just recognizing that it's a problem, mm-hmm. right? A lot of nits don't even recognize it as a problem. They yeah. see it as a benefit. So just understanding, like, if you are really, really nitty, it is inherently a problem. So once you understand that and you understand how messed up your frequencies are, the real next step is just to say, okay, where can I start adding extra hands into my range? And I've done a podcast episode on that. I've done tons and tons of content on that. But ultimately, it's just looking for extra spots where you can open up your ranges. And it's not just, you know, the obvious of open a little bit wider preflop, but it's also looking for things like three bets, looking for spots where you can call wider with position, assuming stacks aren't too shallow. And really starting to think ahead and not just say, oh, well, if I don't have aces or kings preflop, I don't give action, but saying, okay, what's the situation and could this situation be profitable if I just get in there and fight for it? Yep, there are. Lots yeah. of opportunities like that. I'm definitely going to have to listen to that podcast. I really appreciate you putting that one out, that one out because for the longest time, that was one of my issues. You know, when, when you play the micro stakes, you realize that some players are just so loose and some guys are so fishy, you can be profitable with a pretty nitty style. But as you try to move up in stakes, you've got to expand it, you know? Yeah, for sure. And it's it's one of those where there can be certain games, like literally in the same exact game, where you're playing nitty against some opponents and you're playing quite laggy against others once those maniacs get out of your way. Mm-hmm. So it's just one of those where like you have to be really fluid in this game. And if you're looking to implement some static hand chart or some static strategy, the days of that working are kind of long gone. And it's gotcha. time for us to start being more dynamic and understanding the situation is deeper rather than just relying on things like hand charts. And if you have X hand, then you can continue. Or if you don't, then you don't. Totally. That makes sense. You got to play, uh, you, and you know, your decisions have to be kind of player dependent and look to exploit those opponents that you're up against. That's exactly right. Exactly. So right. So, um, you know, one of the reasons I, why I really wanted to have you on is, uh, you know, you created your course, the hand reading lab. And when I first heard about the hand reading lab, I knew that it was going to be something that would completely revolutionize my game. And I really have to say that without a doubt, it has revolutionized my game. And I really want to thank you so much for creating this course. Oh, you're very welcome. And I'm I'm super glad to hear that it's been helpful for you. And hopefully it'll be helpful for quite a few people in the future as well. Absolutely. I'm sure it will be. Um, You know, I want to know what prompted you to make this course. Hand reading is something that everyone talks about and everyone has seen Daniel Negreanu nail down. Hey, you have Jack Seven suited, you know, on TV and that kind of stuff. And, you know, we have this idea that hand reading is something that that we need to know and we need to do, but often most of us don't do it. Is that why you created the course? Because it's a skill that needs to be learned? Not only because it needs to be learned, but because it's one of the few skills you use in every single hand, Mm -hmm. right? It's not like developing a squeezing skill set doesn't help you double barrel better and learning how to value bet thinner on the river doesn't help you call better preflop, right? So there's just one of those things where no matter what you want to do more of, whether it's three betting, whether it's opening wider preflop, whether it's contending on more turns, whether it's finding more hero calls on rivers, you have to have a really strong hand reading skill set. So it's one of those where, you know, pretty much everything I do nowadays is based on research. So I talk to a lot of students. I really keep my ear to the ground as much as humanly possible. And that's in my YouTube comments on videos. That's on the forum. That's on feedback that I just get through email. And once I start seeing a common thread of a topic come up, it's like, okay, that's probably something that I either need to make a video on or need to make a book on or need to make a course on or need to do something with it. And hand reading just kept coming up. And it's one of those things that it's, it's kind of complicated to teach because it, for some people, it's going to be way too advanced. And for other people, it's going to be way too simplified. But it, it's really hard to find kind of a Goldilocks of what is going to benefit the most amount of po- 
people possible that end up viewing the content. And that's what I really tried to find with the hand reading lab. So I started creating it in like, I think September, give or take. Mm -hmm. And I, I did what I normally do. I create like the first third. I create the outline. I create all that stuff. I create about a third of the content. And then I take a couple months off of the content, come back to it fresh. And it was like, okay, these are all the extra things I need to add to it. And then once that happened, it was kind of just a smash through the content. I, and I think we came up with something really, really solid. Yeah, without a doubt you did. And and you had said, yeah, it might not be for the absolute beginner in poker. There's a lot of basic strategy and stuff you need to learn first. Things that once you learn it, help you do the hand reading step by step and street by street and everything. And it's just one of those where like, you need basic skill sets first, right? You need to understand basic things like basic poker math and pot odds and all that kind of stuff. You need to have a basic understanding on how this game really works. But it's one of those where like once you're sitting there scratching your head like, mm, what should I study next? No matter what it is at that point, whether it's you're trying to learn new plays, you're trying to you know work on GTO, whatever the heck it is, you're going to need hand reading skills. So that's kind of like once you're at that stage where you have a lot of the basics hammered out and you're like, eh, I don't really know what I should be doing next. Hand reading is probably a spot where you should at least start paying some decent attention. But you also don't want to work on hand reading until you understand basic things like when you should value bet, when you should pull the trigger and bluff, how often bluffs need to work, all that kind of stuff. Once you have that stuff down, then yeah, hand reading becomes very, very crucial. Yeah, without a doubt it does. When did, in your poker career, you've been playing for over a decade now, when did you actually dive in and figure out hand reading for yourself? Years and years and years ago. Good, so, okay. Yeah, it was one of those where I really should have started creating this course earlier or even just created a video or two on it. Actually, I took that back. I did do that. So a long while ago, God, five, six, no. Yeah, probably like six years ago, I did a one of my first webinars. And I didn't even call it a webinar back then. I think I called it a tank. Mm -hmm. And we talked all about hand reading. And it was like a two or three hour ordeal. And I started selling that as a standalone thing on my site. And... At one point, I went back and rewatched it. It was like, this is really good, but it needs to get cleaned up. It needs to get refined, and it needs to get expanded. And that's when I took it down and really started thinking about what a complete course could look like. And that was kind of like a starting basis of this. But it, it has been something that I've been working on forever and ever because I recognize the value in it. But it was really difficult to teach it without having a really, really complete knowledge of a lot of aspects of this game. Because otherwise, like you can't just teach hand reading preflop because you also need to carry that through to postflop. And just like you can't just focus on hand reading three bet pots, you need it in single raise pots. So it kind of forced me to really stand back and say, okay, how can we get all of this covered succinctly as possible, but also as powerfully as possible? Absolutely. And I think you did that, uh, you know, from, from my own perspective, when it came to hand rating up until I took this lab, my hand reading, I wouldn't say it's backwards, but I would often start at the wrong spot. Like maybe I was reviewing a hand and then suddenly, uh, I get double barreled on the turn. And then that's the point where I start to put him on a range. Well, it was a king of clubs, so now there's three clubs on the board. He could have had a king, maybe ace, king, preflop, maybe even has a set of kings now. Maybe he hit the flush, and that's why he's double barreling. You know, I would go through all of those things, but your course really taught me just simply start off preflop, assign him a range, and narrow it from there. And the entire course, you know, it's 27 freaking videos long, man. I mean, it is, it's an awesome, humongous, well-built course. And it, and it pushes you right through from preflop all the way to the river. And it was perfect right up my alley, right what I needed. Well, thank you. And that's awesome to hear that. That's kind of exactly the process that the whole lab is trying to give you is that really succinct and logical process going from street to street and understanding, like you can't just start hand reading on the turn because what the heck did he have preflopping on the flop, right? So when you start from early on and you develop those really strong preflop hand reading skills and just basically understanding what people are opening with, what people are three betting with, what people are calling your three bets with, that gives you the starting point to look through the rest of the hand through a very, very crisp lens. But if you don't do that, then you're either just guessing, you're looking at worst case scenario things and just being like, oh, I don't know, he could have nine six. It's like, well, did he really have nine six preflop? Come on now. Yeah. So that and that's kind of like goes back to like the nitty point earlier is when you don't have good hand reading skills, it's easy to fool yourself and say, well, this person could have the worst case scenario here. And it's like, yeah, maybe. But like if you look at the whole thing logically, it's very unlikely that that's really going to be the case. 
Without a doubt, it has. You know, uh, for a smart poker study, we have a poker discussion group, and that's what I often find when people post hands within the group. It, it often a lot of the thoughts that people have are they look at worst case scenario. Um, sometimes they just ignore what could possibly be bad and just say you got to shove here no matter what but oftentimes people look at that worst case scenario and say oh he's got a flush you've got a fold and um, I noticed that a lot of people just never really take hand reading into account when they're reviewing hands or even commenting on hands in forums yeah exactly and that became really really apparent I released an exercise maybe two three four weeks ago and the whole exercise was just a single hand history, and I asked people to essentially hand read their opponent from every single street. So starting from preflop, then flop, then turn the river. And it became very, very apparent that people are just not doing this. Mm -hmm. And that's really what the lab looks to solve, is saying, okay, we're going to take you on this journey and get you through to understanding things on a step-by-step -step basis. Because once you have that process, you're never going to be as lost. Sure, maybe you make some incorrect assumptions. And let's be honest, we're all going to make those kind of mistakes in hand reading. We're all going to you know, maybe assume that Jack-10 is the bottom of his range, but in all actuality, it was actually Jack-7 suited. Mm -hmm. didn't make any sense to us. It just happened to be the case. And you know what? We learn from it. We assign a more appropriate range in the future, and we, we go forward. But when you don't even start by saying, okay, what's like the bottom of his range here? What's the top of his range here? You're just guessing. And when you just guess in this game, you are in for a world of hurt. It is going to be really painful because you're never going to know where you are. You're never going to know where they are. And good luck at that point. Absolutely. I got to agree with you at 100% uh, there. You know, earlier in our conversation, you were talking about when you were in Vegas and you were talking about pie charts and... Uh, you know, how, how, you know, between poker and your business and everything, you know, it, it seems like you, I get a really good sense how your mind kind of works and you visualize everything, not everything, but a lot of things in a pie chart kind of thing. And, and you actually equate a lot of hand reading to pie charts and putting somebody on a range of hands, you know, maybe their strong hands are only 10% of the pie chart, you know, medium strength hands are 80% and, you know, the bottom of their range, I'm sorry, like super weak hands are another 10%. You know, it's, it's really interesting how your mind works and how you visualize pie charts for a lot of aspects of poker and for life. Yeah, definitely for life. Everything that I, that works through my brain pretty much works through some sort of mathematical grid or chart or something. It drives my wife nuts, but <laughs> it's just one of those things that that's how my brain is pre-wired. I'm very, very attached to that. And the pie chart model just seemed to be something that was simple enough to visualize in real time. If nothing else, just to say, okay, if we look at our opponent's range right this moment, what's the density of strong hands to medium hands to weak hands in that range? Because once we can say, okay, there's a strong density of really strong hands in our opponent's range, okay, should we really be you know, hero calling against that person? But on the flip side of that, if they have a large density of you know, crappy floats and the turn card doesn't really change much, could we fire again very easily with nonsense? And typically that's the case. But again, when you don't have just even a basic visual cue to say, okay, this is a good spot to get aggressive or this is a good spot to fight your opponent's range – again, you're just guessing or, or worse, you're just leaving a large chunk of money on the table. And that's just something that I, I don't really love doing anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're, oh no, yeah, you don't want to do that at all. And then visualizing it as a, as a pie chart helps you to make the proper decisions. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, it's, it's a good model to work in because it's very easy to visualize. Mm -hmm. Now for all people that won't work, some people may actually just work on a, a four by four grid. And, you know, put different different hand strengths in different parts of that grid. And that could work for them. For me, it's just pie chart works easiest. And that's what I taught in the lab. And I think once people see it, they're like, oh, okay, I get it. So if we look at a three bet range that's 10% wide, but only two and a half percent of it is really strong or two and a half percent of hands. So let's just say queens plus ace king then the other 75% of that pie chart is going to be probably garbage in some respect. And just having that basic visual is like, oh, okay, I can just attack him whenever the heck I want with pure impunity and super, super profitably. Mm -hmm. But when you don't even like think about it like that or even have a basic idea on what is strong versus weak, again, we're just back to guessing. And we never want to be doing that in this game. We're too smart for that. Absolutely, yeah. Guessing just ruins those profits right there. You've got to know, you know, beyond... I was I was gonna say beyond a shadow of a doubt, but you have a you have to have a very good idea of what they got before you start making your bets and raises and calls without a doubt. 
Sure, exactly. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're just guessing and burning money, most likely. Yep, yep. And those are the guys you want to take advantage of, those guessers out there, those fish. Precisely. And there's tons of them. I mean, handwriting is a really complex skill set. And it's one that takes a long time to build. And I mean, that's why this this thing, there's so many hours of content in this lab, simply because it takes that much time just to explain it all. And it's going to take a little bit longer than that even to digest it all. But once you digest it all, that's where the power is. Because it's something that you can learn once, you can refine and iterate over time. But once you learn the basic brain dump the first time, it's with you forever and you can use it forever. Just like you learn pot odds once and you use it forever. Same thing with hand reading, at least the basic, bo- the bare bones skill set of it, learn it once, refine and reiterate over time, um, iterate over time and poker becomes a lot more fun. Absolutely. It does. Once you, once you have skills like this in your arsenal. Yeah. Um, exactly. So uh, what level, it's kind of hard to say what level of players, but you know, if, if a player came to you, uh, what level should they be or what kind of player should they be if they you know, want to sign up for the hand reading lab? I mean, you don't want your basic, basic beginners to sign up, but maybe what stake should players be playing at or what skill sets do they need to work on when they decide, hey, this hand reading lab's for me? Sure. So the lab itself, all the examples, I'm just going to say this right off the bat, are from live poker. So it's going to be one, two, and two, five examples. So it's one of those where someone might look at that and say, well, this is only for live players. And not really. The framework itself works for any level. Work. It doesn't matter what you play. It works for it. Yep. It's just, are you going to feel comfortable with that? And obviously the price limit or the price tag is a little bit high as well. So this is definitely not for pure beginners. I've had a lot of people ask me, hey, I'm newer. I saw your lab. I'm thinking about getting it. I'm like, please don't. Just yeah. <laughs> do, do not start with this. There are so many other good things you can start with that'll get you a much stronger ROI. And then this is ready for you later. So this is for people that have been studying for a while, playing for a while. They don't necessarily have to be winners, don't necessarily have to be losers. They just have to understand that there's room in their game to improve. And the more times per session you're in a situation and you're like, I really have no idea where he's at or you're constantly trying to hand read and people are constantly showing up with hands that were nowhere close to the range you assigned. Mm -hmm. When you're finding that kind of thing creep in a lot, that's when this is going to have the most amount of relevance and use for you. But if you're brand new, I'd say probably skip it. If you've been around forever and ever and you find yourself being a pretty damn strong hand reader, you're typically within the range very, very easily and you're pretty pinpointy. Eh, probably not for you either. So it's really for people that are in the middle, understand the value in the study, understand the value in the skill set. That's going to be where you get the benefit of it. But I really don't ever want someone to buy this and then not watch it, right? If you're going to buy it, invest in it, invest the time into it and really get what's there. If you just buy it, watch two videos and then never tune back into it, it's a massive waste. And I'd really hate to see people do that. Totally. I can agree with that there. Uh, one thing, you know, after taking this lab, I, I'm a much better hand reader now, and I'm actually getting better at it in game. You know, reading so, hands off the table is super, not super easy, but so much easier than doing it in game. What kind of, like, how would you recommend somebody in game while they're at the table with the stress of their hand and their chips in at risk and everything? How do they really practice hand reading in game? So it's one of those where you learn the skill set first and then you practice it by analyzing hands off the table. So that would be analyzing in a forum, that could be analyzing your own hands, that could be watching poker on TV and pausing as you go through, whatever it is. It's not, you don't practice the first few times in real time. Because like you said, there's too many other stressors going on, there's too many other things that are blocking your attention, whether you're playing online or live, it doesn't matter. So that's not where you get your practice. You get your practice from studying hand histories and forums and all that kind of stuff. And then once you're like, okay, I'm starting to get this, it's starting to feel comfortable, then you just focus a lot more in real time. And when you're playing, you know, whether it's live or online, you don't have a tremendously large time bank. So you just do the absolute best you can. And any single time that you're not sure, or you're like, oh my God, this person showed up with a hand that I never thought they'd show up with. Then you will write it down, you study it later, get back to business. Again, it's, it's that process of iterating, not just saying, I'm going to buy the lab, I'm going to watch all the videos, I'm going to be a perfect hand reader forever. Mm-hmm. Just understanding that it's a skill set and a framework that you need to really thrive in this game, but it's always going to be getting iterated on because the exact games, the exact ranges that your players use in your games could very easily differ than the players in my games and the ranges in my games. But the framework itself will always stay the same. 
it's just understanding, okay, these are the little nuances that change as I go from game to game, level to level, whatever it is. Awesome. Does your mind, when you're playing a hand, does your mind visualize a Flopzilla matrix? Correct. Awesome. <laughs> so, and it's not perfect. I, uh-huh. I don't, you know, I, some people ask me that and I'm like, yeah, my brain works like that. They're like, oh my God, that must be so awesome. It's like, well, it's, it's plus or minus, mm-hmm. right? But if I can be plus or minus five or 10% every single time, and I'm not plus or minus 20% every single there time, you go. that's huge. Mm-hmm. And like, people just don't understand like that level of tightness, just tightening it up and tightening it up and tightening it up is just going to make you so much stronger. And you're not going to question things as much. And you're not going to waste brain power worrying about things in real time because you're going to be confident that the framework is right. You may be wrong on an assumption. That's going to happen. In fact, that happens probably every single session you play. And that's okay. The whole point is just to make sure that you're doing it better and better every single session you play. And eventually, the game's just going to become really, really succinct and much simpler, especially when you're playing in not super deep games. Yeah, I gotcha. Well, yeah, I recommend for for most of the listeners out there, as long as you follow, I guess, kind of fit within the guidelines that uh, that you had just talked about, James. Yeah, this is a great a great program for everybody. And you know, for the listeners, this interview today is actually the first in a series of nine episodes, which are going to be all about hand reading and specifically some of the skills that James teaches in the hand reading lab. It'll be you know like the series of podcasts that I did on Ed Miller's book, uh, The Course. So I won't be giving away all of Split suits hand reading secrets it'll, or secrets it'll be more of me like taking one thing that split suit says in one of the 27 videos or the bonus material and expanding upon it you know how how does that work for you james that sounds excellent do you know which which topics you're going to dive into at all um you know i have a list that i made um let me take a look at it here. Uh, let's see. Okay, podcast one is probably going to be like the importance of paying attention to showdowns. Uh, number two would be visualizing percentage form as actual hands within a matrix. And uh, I'll third- be very interested to see how that sounds in podcast form. Yeah. Well, the past week, I actually did kind of a, a version of this talking about percentage form. And I hope I did it justice, but I think I can dive into it a little bit better and maybe uh maybe be more clear on a few things because it is it is a very visual thing but i think i might do the podcast and do one or two or maybe an expanded visual not a visual an expanded um what show is, notes uh, or something yeah well expanded show notes uh, along with a video like accompanying the podcast you know what Ooh, i mean excellent. yeah that's like awesome. a two part thing yeah sure. and then i've got um on top of those i've got seven other or six other different topics from different videos that that i'm going to talk about so i have it planned but i don't know exactly how this is all going to go together yet you know i'm just kind of sure. you know planning everything out right now but i'm really looking forward to the series very cool. Yeah, I can't wait to see what it sounds like either. Well, sweet, man. Awesome. Well, you know, James, it was great having you on today, and I'm sure the listeners got a ton of information from you, and I really appreciate the time, uh, and, and, you know, thank you so very much. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. We'll talk soon. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, before you go, what's the best way for listeners to learn from you or, you know, to simply get in touch with you? I'd say the simplest way is to find me on Twitter. That's at SplitSuit, S-P-L-I-T-S-U-I-T, all one word. Or, of course, you can always find me on Red Chip Hooker. There's a great forum over there. So if you're looking for more community, it's definitely a great place to post hands, respond to hands, ask questions, and I'm in there pretty much every single day. So if you're looking for th- looking for me anywhere, that's a great place to find me. Cool beans. And, and oh, you know something? I almost forgot. You've been so generous with your time today, but your generosity really doesn't stop there. You have a special offer for my listeners who purchased the hand reading lab using the offer code SMART. Can you tell us a little bit about that offer? Sure. So if you use the offer SMART and just whenever you go to the hand reading lab website, that's you can find it at splitsuit.com slash HRL or, of course, in your show notes. Mm-hmm. You can find it there. And then once you use the, the code SMART, you'll get my plain 3-Bet Pot series for free. It's a $50 series. You get three videos in it, including simplifying 3-Bet Pots, reacting to 3-Bets, which is extremely, extremely powerful, especially if you're starting to move into more aggressive games, and then also advanced 3-Bets, which is all about playing in three bet pots, both pre flop and post flop, and looking at it from a more advanced angle. So, if you use the code SMART at checkout, you get all of those videos for free. Awesome. Thank you so much, James, for the lab and for your time today. I really appreciate it, man. You're very welcome, Sky. Thanks so much for having me. Yep. Thank you. Take care. 
I'd like to once again thank James for joining us today. You can find everything that he and I discussed in the show notes at smartpokerstudy.com slash pod 62, so head on over. Also, please check out his podcast and training site at redshippoker.com or click the links in the show notes. And if you're interested in purchasing or learning more about the hand reading lab, visit splitsuit.com slash hrl and use the offer code SMART in lowercase to receive the bonus playing 3-Bet Pots video series. And of course, thank you all for listening. Send me your constructive feedback through the show notes page. You can also send an email to sky at smartpokerstudy.com Tweet me at Smart Poker Study or post in the Facebook group at smartpokerstudy.com slash discuss. And I need your questions for the Friday episodes. Please send them to me through all the channels just mentioned. And don't forget to visit patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy to support the show and collect some nice monthly rewards. Alrighty, poker people, be sure to listen to Friday's Q&A where I answer three of your amazing questions. And next week's Tuesday episode starts my eight-episode series all on hand-reading and Split Suits hand-reading lab. Don't miss it. Word of mouth is the best advertising, and a recommendation from you to your friends is super appreciated. If you enjoyed our time together and learned a little something, please share it with other poker people. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet.